You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about exciting, creative, and innovative ways of living. Produced in Santa Barbara, California, Sustainable World focuses on positive solutions to environmental challenges, solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics, earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned to Sustainable World Radio. I'm Jill Cloutier. When you think of Hawaii, what comes to mind? For many of us, we envision beautiful beaches, warm, clear water, and hotel luau's filled with sunburned tourists wearing aloha shirts. But there is another Hawaii, and I found it when I visited the Waihee Coastal Dunes and Wetlands Refuge on the island of Maui. The refuge, managed by the Hawaiian Islands Land Trust, contains spring-fed wetlands, acres of dunes ecosystems, marine shoreline, and riparian habitat. The Waihee Refuge is a wonderful example of the great biodiversity that can be found in Hawaii. Once home to four of Maui's ruling chiefs, the refuge narrowly escaped its proposed development as a destination golf course. I was greeted at the entrance of the refuge by Scott Fisher, Director of Conservation for the Hawaiian Islands Land Trust. E po mai ka i mai e, e komo mai ka la ionei ya aina, he aina ki pa aloha, aloha e, aloha e, aloha e. Just welcoming you to the land, letting you know the sacred sites around here, the important sites that were um, that that surround us. That the kupuna, the elders, are still with us. The ivi kupuna that we stand on, the honua, the aina, uh, the land and the and the, the land which feeds us in particular. It's a very sacred site. It's 277-acre uh, refuge. Very important area culturally. A total of 93 archaeological sites. These archaeological sites date back to as early as 941. AD uh, at a site here known as Kehoni. Um, that, that site uh, happens to correspond with uh, a, a, some writings of early Hawaiian historians of a chief who lived here named Hua Apuhukaina in, uh, in an enclosure known as Niua, who died, according to um, Samuel Kamakau, around the year 1000. And so when Samuel Kamakau wrote that, and then in 1988 we did an archaeological study down here, not we, uh, it was our pri- previous owners, um, kind of validated that. And so a number of very important sites. Of course, right now where we're standing, um, the Waihei Coastal Dunes and Wetlands Refuge, we are on the Mokupuni, or island of Maui. We are in the Moku, or district of Wailuku. Uh, we are in the Ahupua of Waihei. We're in the Ili, or the subsection of the Ahupua of Kapoho. Poho, of, of course, means uh, a bowl. It can also mean like the hollow, like the hollow of your hand. And if you look around us, there's these 200-foot-high sand dunes that surround us. Um, these are the last of the unmodified, the la- last largest unmodified sand dunes that once went from, once went from Kalaika Ho'omano at Waihei Point all the way out to Ma'alaya and from Ma'alaya all the way out to McKenna. And those, those sand dunes um, are sadly largely lost. What our goal is is to preserve them, um, to restore them ecologically. They're a very important nesting habitat for uh, seabirds, particularly the pelagic seabirds, the open ocean seabirds, um, uwa'ukani or the wedge-tailed shearwater, the uwa'u, the Hawaiian petrel, probably before them, um, a number of other species. And so uh, what we're doing here on the Waihei Refuge is sort of threefold. Uh, First of all, of course, we preserve and protect the numerous, the 93 archaeological sites on the property. Of course, I say 93. Those are state-listed archaeological sites. There are undoubtedly hundreds if not thousands more um, than what is listed so uh, with an occupation history of going back to roughly a thousand AD um, there's going to be lots and lots of archaeological sites so uh, the first thing we preserve and protect and to a limited degree uh, interpret those sites second thing we do is uh, we do ecological restoration now ecological restoration in general ecological restoration is undoing the disturbances caused by humans, what we call anthropogenic disturbances. And what we're trying to do is take out the non-native species, plant species in particular, and replace them with 
um, the indigenous and endemic plant species that once belonged here, and in doing so, re restoring the ecosystem. Um, now, restoration has, a, you know, when we talk about restoring the ecosystem, and especially the plants, what we're talking about is the, the function, composition, and structure of the ecosystem, uh, giving greater weight to both the, uh, the function of the ecosystem and the structure. Uh, because so many species have been lost, so many species are, are now in highly endangered or no longer exist, they've been completely extirpated from this area or, or lost um, for all time to extinction, um, what we want to do is try and get that structure back. What was the structure of the ecosystem? And so it's, it's, a, it's a process. We've been at it for about seven and a half years. We're making progress slowly and we have a lot of participation, which brings me to the third thing that we do. Third thing, of course, we do is education. And that's, uh, as you were coming in, you saw some students. Um, what we want to do is we want them to understand how important this place was, is, and that they have to take on that kuleana. If they don't accept the kuleana of caring for the land, there won't be any keiki, any children, to actually hand off to again. So it's absolutely critical to, to care for the land. And so that's what we try and teach here. Can you give our listeners who may not know about Hawaii an idea of how many species, there's a lot of species that have been lost, and yeah. maybe just a basic idea of what's been going on here environmentally? Yeah, um, you know, island ecosystems are very, very sensitive to um, anthropogenic or human-made disturbance. And so because these islands are so sensitive to that type of disturbance, it's easy to lose that, those, those populations. Uh, for example, there's a there was a, a very dominant species that we, that uh, of uh, herb layer species, uh, you know, a, a low shrub that they kept seeing in the pollen record, and they they could they can do coring in the wetlands, and they can uh, as they are doing the coring, they can actually see this this pollen of this plant was very very dominant, very common, and they never knew what it was, and then about about twenty years ago or so, uh, they were on an island the island of Kaho'olawe. And Kaho'olawe is a sea stack off of Kaho'olawe. Kaho'olawe was, of course, a target island for many years, so nobody expected um, to find much botanically. And a sea stack, and one of the uh, employees of the, of the Depart Division of Land and Natural Resources, who was very, very familiar with native plants, an incredible resource, looked over and he couldn't quite make out the gestalt of this particular plant. And he, he you know, he kind of ran, running through all the plants that he knew and couldn't make it out and, and finally said we need to get over there and so they got a helicopter and went over there and all of a sudden they found this plant that there were two individuals left and they found that that it was this species that had all of the, uh, the, the so that's the one generating all the pollen cores so as we're standing here and I'm looking around um, of course your radio listeners won't be able to see it but as you look around and if you come to Hawaii the lowlands below about at least 2,000 foot elevation on most islands you look around and you don't see any indigenous or endemic species. Um, you see a number of Polynesian introduced species, coconut for example, or, or uh, milo, the, uh, the thespesia. You see some of those, mostly what you see, the vast majority of what you see has been brought in since 1778 and probably since the about 1850s. So uh, Hawaii's experienced tremendous loss. Just to give you an example, I mentioned earlier the 200 foot high sand dunes. Those sand dunes surround us. When humans first arrived on these islands, there were no rats, there were no dogs, cats, mongoose, cattle egret, the, the, a type of heron bird. There were no predators, virtually no predators. There were, there were a few, but they were, uh, they were in a healthy ecosystem. The prey species and, and predators are in this kind of dynamic balance. And so with the arrival of humans, and not humans specifically necessarily, but the, what they brought, for example, um, they brought the rats, and the rats eat the eggs, and the rats can attack the chicks. And the rats, you know, I can only imagine, got off the canoes and looked around, and it was an ideal habitat for them. There were flightless birds. There were birds that had never seen a rat before and so didn't know to respond to them as a threat. A couple of years ago, I spent some time on Midway Atoll where they're doing tremendous works with uh, some of the pelagic seabirds. And there you get a sense of what even a 1,200 acres of, of 
relatively, I mean, it's not undisturbed there, but what, when, you, when you provide the habitat for these species, what can happen? Where you don't have the, the amount of predators. We estimate that, that the, uh, these 105 acres of sand dunes could have held up to a million seabirds. Now we have three. And every year, we get a certain portion, a, a certain number of lost. You know, if we lose any from here, there's been years we've lost all of them to predators, dogs in particular, cats as well, mongoose. So it's a real challenge. And so what we're trying to do is stop that, you know. Um, and I think for those who work with us, anybody who works in this field of conservation, especially in Hawaii, we all understand ourselves to be, you know, kalu uh, kanui kaina. We're, we're taro planted in the earth. That's what we see ourselves as, I think. We're, we're of the earth, we're kua'aina, we're the ones who are, 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 our backs are made of the land. And so it's, it's a labor of love. It's something that when, when we work, we know that we're healing our aina. We're, we're actually getting in touch with our kupuna. Um, so it's, a, it's an amazing experience, really just so much fun to work in this, in this type of field. To know that, that what, what I share with my children about um, that which is most important to us um, can be preserved and it can be done it's the problem is not with the land the problem is kawahi ma vaena ika pepe iau the area between the ears the brain could you tell us what the mission statement is of your organization and the mission statement of the hawaiian islands land trust is to protect the places that sustain us for the benefit of current and future generations i mean it, it, encoded in that is what sustains us i mean it's also what what nourishes our kino, our body, as well as what nourishes us um, spiritually, our uhane. So there's, and of course, in Hawaiian thing, you don't make a false dichotomy. The uhane, at least in a living person, is not separated from the kino, from the, from the body. Um, but um, what we do is we identify lands, uh, and there's, you know, there's some priorities that we give. Um, culturally significant lands are very high on our priority list. Lands um, including lands that tell the story of life on the land. Uh, Keola Okaina, Keola Ikaina, um, the land, the life on the land. So it, lands that tell that story are very important. How people live sustainably. You know, Hawaii had a population that was um, perhaps as high as, um, you know, 800,000 to 1.2 million, according to at least one researcher at the University of Hawaii. Um, so it was a fairly substantial population. Um, I don't think anybody knows exactly what the population was, but it, it, it could have been very significant. And they lived without external imports. They lived without, uh, they lived a very different lifestyle. But they, didn't, they were able to feed themselves. They were able to distribute the food effectively. Again, emphasizing the fact that it's a very different life that we live now. And, and I don't think um, anybody is necessarily advocating that we go back to those times. But we need to think very carefully about how we sustain ourselves, both spiritually and physically. So we look at culturally significant lands. We also look at lands that are um, agriculturally important. And so we, we have agricultural easements on a number of our lands. Recently, we, recently in upcountry Maui, we had... a. Uh, in a conservation easement close to 12,000 acres of, of, of ranch lands. And so uh, we have a number of areas where, you know, some of those are, that's a very large one. We're working on projects that are as small as five acres um, of, of taro producing lands. Because, again, we need to think both in terms of what feeds us, but what also sustains us as a culture, as a as a as a Hawaiian culture. And not everybody in the state is ethnically Hawaiian, is Kanaka Maoli, native Hawaiian. But I think there's a recognition that um, we could all do well by thinking back, reflecting back to an era when we were living more sustainably. And how did our kupuna, how did our elders do that? How did our, our ancestors do that? How are you finding out yeah. from the elders how Hawaiians traditionally work yeah. the land? Um, so traditionally, Hawaiians, um, you know, you, you pass down generationally um, uh, through your, you know, genealogical, you might call it genealogical knowledge. In Hawaiian, that's mo'oku au hau. Um, that information was passed down from, from family member to family member um, on how to care for the land, how to protect the land, how to, how to understand your kuleana, your responsibility to the land. Then we have these wonderful scholars, um, David Malo, John Papai'i, Samuel Kamakau, uh, all these wonderful scholars who w took the time and had the uh, intellect to collect 
knowledge, you know, uh, the traditional knowledge, and and to kind of codify it into a document, into into books. And actually, originally it was uh, uh, newspaper articles, and codify that information into these. Uh, what later became now we have the books. Um, so, ruling chiefs of Hawaii, for example, is the is the history of of the islands, more or less a political history. Um, so these wonderful books. So that that's a that's a great resource for someone like myself to understand um, what was what was the vision, what was the 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 ike, the wisdom, the the vision of of the kupuna. Um, but of course, the, in Hawaiian thinking, I think you had to also put that with the na'au au. And of course, we, the na'au au is, I think in in the West we think of thinking with your mind, with your brain, or your heart, which are both good. In Hawaiian, you always go to the na'au au. The uh, uh, literally translated as gut, but it, it has more of a. It's where your emotions re- reside. Um, so you're, it, you know, you're. you're your gut, your opu, is connected, of course, to your pico. And your pico is how you are connected to your, your kupuna. Your pico is your, um, is your umbilical cord. Or not your umbilical cord, but your, your navel. And from your navel, you're connected to your, to your kupuna. And through your ma'i, your, your genitals, you're connected to your, uh, your children, your keiki. So the, that, that knowledge is passed down. So you're, you have, that's your kuleana as a, as a full... Kanaka, you have responsibility to the kupuna, the this generation, the, the ancestors, this generation, and you also have children. You have responsibility to your your keiki and your mo'opuna, your your grandchildren. So, what we try and do here is take on those ideas, take on those values, and and those values are what really drive us to want to care for the land and and to and to not only this land in particular, but to make Maui a sustainable place. There's been a lot of changes on the island, and um, change is inevitable. But it doesn't necessarily have to be changed for the worse. It can always be changed for the better. And so that's that's where I sort of uh, I work to try and make this island more sustainable. I I, you know, I speak to my kids in Hawaiian as much as possible. I I pound poi with my kids. We we try and we have a taro patch up here going in um, starting tomorrow. We're going to be building taro patches, and that's going to be our taro patch. We have about five. Um, we have a, a taro farmer who's a wonderful, just an incredibly knowledgeable taro farmer, and she is just um, about out there almost every week um, working uh, manuahi free. You know, she does it. She does it because it's a it's a labor of love, and so that's where that that's where the na'au au comes in. So you're, so you're really trying. You're you are. You're living the energy of the land and really taking care, being a steward of the land. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Probably because most of your listeners are not from Hawaii. The the state motto, which was actually uttered by uh, King uh, Kawikeau Uli um, after the the kingdom was restored, after the British had overthrown him briefly, um, and he uh, Kawai Hau Church came up and um, in front of his community, in front of his constituency, in front of his um, people, he said the words Ua mau ke e o ka i ka pono, The life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. And that's been adopted as our state motto, which is a wonderful motto. But we need to live that motto, too. Uh, it's not enough to put it on a seal and let it, let it stagnate and sit and, and uh, be used by whomever wants to uh, say, oh, well, we're doing the right thing for the land. You have to know what is pono. Pono is a very important concept. It's uh, oftentimes used. You see it all over Hawaii. Pono is, is not, it gets translated as righteousness. Yeah, it's a it's a fair translation. It's it's a it's a quick translation. Pono is a better way to translate pono is it's the right ordering of the world. When when things are are right, when when the when the the mana of the land is determining um, where we're going as people, not us saying, "Well, we have this technology, and our technology can solve any problem." Yes, technology is good. No one, you know, I don't, very few people um, doubt that. Technology is fine. But you have to ho'olohi pono i ka'aina. You have to listen carefully to the land. And so if we don't do that, then we're in real trouble. And that's where I think there's a, a disconnect. And why it's so important to bring children on the land is because we have this, um, I mean, now they, my, my wife is a psychologist, so... Um, 
there is a now a, a disorder. I don't know if it's a formal dis disorder in the DSM four, but there's a, um, I think it's a, a nature, nature deficit, deficit disorder. Nature deficit disorder. Yeah, NDD. Um, we're doing our part to try and counteract that. Um, if we lose connection to the aina, to the land, we're sunk. And so, uh, you know, how did Hawaiians think about sustainability? Um, I, I mean, it's a it's a complex thing. Okay, so there, the the most easy way to state that is that Hawaiians thought about sustainability in terms of mauka to makai, from the ocean to the to the sea. Now I mentioned earlier we are in the ahupua'a of of Waihei. The ahupua'a extended from the the summit of the of the mountain in general, not always, but most ahupua'a or the, the classic idea of the ahupua'a extended from the mountain, summit of the mountain, down to the sea, but out to the lipo, the, the purple, that deep purple um, in the ocean. And so the the manager of that ahupua, known as the Konohiki, was responsible for that, uh, for that tract of land. You, but you can further subdivide it. So you can laterally subdivide it. So here we are longitudinally, um, Mauka to Makai, ocean to sea. But latitudinally, you can divide that between the Vau Akua, the, the upper reaches of the, of the, what we might think of as the watershed, upper reaches of the mountain. Incredible resources there. But it was Vau Akua. It was, the, it was the, d- the domain of the gods. And so if you went into that domain, you were entering their domain, you were subject to their mana, and so uh, you had to utilize it carefully. Uh, and what that translated into being is that those areas were not impacted heavily. And so today, that's really the only area, I mentioned earlier, 1,200 feet. If you get up to 3,000, 4,000 feet, you can be in an area that is largely, some areas at least, that is largely intact. Um, that Bau Akua was where birds were collected for the for the the beautiful capes and the mahioli, the helmets. Um, the Hawaiian feather work was just unparalleled. It was beautiful. Um, below the Vau Akua was the Vau Kanaka, the, the, literally the, the, the forest of the human forest. And that's where, that's where you could, um, that where humans could do what they needed to do for their community to survive. So there was this identification or recognition, rather, that humans had their place in the environment and and you had to tread lightly in other areas and i think we need to re reinvigorate that idea um but in the Val Kanaka, you could grow your kalo and you could grow your ulu your breadfruit kalo of course being the taro taro being the staple of the hawaiian the hawaiians did something unique and that was to um, make poi poi was the staple wonderful stuff most visitors don't have the appreciation that people who are raised on it have um but Kalo uh, was made into poi, poi being the staple um, of, the, of the Hawaiian people. Um, but not only poi, you had ulu, breadfruit, uh, uala, or, or sweet potato, to a letter, lesser degree, uhi, or sweet potatoes, uh, excuse me, uh, yams. Um, you had ohia ai, the mountain apple. Uh, you know, in addition to that, you had, of course, all the resources in the ocean, the limu. And uh, Hawaiians were unbelievably knowledgeable on which limu were available at which time and which fish could be harvested appropriate at what time. And this came from an observational knowledge. People who, had a nature, people who have nature deficit disorder will not know these things because they don't observe carefully. They're not maka'ala, so they're not um, alert enough. And so if we don't do that, we have no hope as a, as, as a people. So the first thing we need to do is get our children on the land. Get them, uh, you know, the, there's a... Uh, Olelo no eao, it says, Huli kalima i kalepo, ola. Huli kalima i kala, aohe. If you put your hands in the soil, you have life. If you put your hands in the, if you turn your hands in the sun, nothing. So, um, that, you know, o, those Olelo no eao reveal those proverbs. Olelo no eao translates as po- proverbs. Those proverbs really are um, so powerful to, uh, to remind us what did our kupuna, what was their thinking, and so um, you know another another proverb that I try to hold on to, or more or less a saying, is uh, kanika papava. 
you know, the, literally the sound of the, of the floorboards of the canoe. So traditionally, one method of Hawaiian burial was that the individual, the, the kupuna, was placed in a canoe as a coffin and then oftentimes put into a, a, uh, a cave. And so I recognize that I'm not always going to be here. I may only be here for a short time. If I don't pass what I've learned and if I don't pass my passions on, then again, as a society, we're, we're failing our keiki. We're failing, more importantly, our mo'opuna. Um, if we, we, we've got to get them back on the land. So we're here in this beautiful space. If we were here, so I see it's green. There's a lot of plants around. If we were here a thousand years ago, I don't mm-hmm. know if that's the right date or so. Sure. Um, what would we be seeing? Okay, yeah. Um, so let's it's kind of take it through through time. Um, if you were the first person to walk ashore, what you would have the, the overwhelming sound would have been the sound of seabirds, millions of seabirds. Um, I mean, we're we're in Waihei. This, these dunes would have been filled with seabirds. Beyond these dunes, we would have had millions and millions. My kind of back of the envelope calculation is that there may have been 20, 30 million seabirds um, in the dunes. I mean, the, the habitat was just so ideal. Um, uh, it, that would have been the first thing I think you would have experienced. Um, second thing you would have experienced is, um, I think, a very large areas of forests of fan palms and... Um, and wetlands down here, you would have you would have had the wetlands and intact wetlands. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think about this question almost every day. What would it have looked like? What if I if I was the first person to step ashore? You also the thing that would have been uh, incredible too is um, you would have stepped ashore and there would have been opihi that were opihi the limpets that feed the people that such an integral part of the Hawaiian diet would have been. I mean, I, on Molokini. I mean, I, I only know by proxy, I guess. On Molokini, I was doing some work on Molokini uh, with seabirds, and here there were opihi that were larger than my hand. And here, if you find one bigger than a quarter, it's, it's unusual. Uh, not unusual, but it, uh, it's remarkable. The, the health of the ecosystem, I did, uh, I was on a, I did some work on uh, the Marshall Islands in, in the South Pacific, and there we were dealing with a healthy, intact reef ecosystem. And uh, every time we'd go out in the water, of course, we'd see sharks. And, of course, the natural impulse is to take a step back and, oh, my gosh, there's a shark. That's what a healthy reef ecosystem looks like. You know, you have predators, of course, but the abundance of fish is just unbelievable. So I think that's what you would have seen here. Perhaps turtles lining the shoreline. Um, Undoubtedly, turtles lining the shoreline, basking um, perhaps monk seals. You know, we're not sure about monk seals, um, what, what their numbers were. It's, they're somewhat cryptic species. Um, and so uh, the monk seals uh, probably would have seen them. We have monk seals down here today. Um, it's, it's always exciting to, to show my kids the monk seals, the ilio holo ika ua ua, the, the dog that runs in the, uh, in the rough waters is the Hawaiian name for them. So you would have, yeah, um, seabirds and, and birds that we don't even see anymore, um, a flightless geese and, a, and a species of, several species of flightless duck that were, you know, three, four feet high, um, flightless rails. You know, there are the, the, uh, there's our peacock making himself known. You know, it would have been, the, 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 what you see, the, the plant composition would have been very different. Um, low stature grasses, shrubs, trees. A conservationist I respect uh, a lot, Ar- uh, Dr. Art Medeiros, um, who works for the USGS and has done amazing work up in an area of Maui known as Awahi, talks about the fact that before the forest was felled, before the forest was altered, you could walk probably around the entire island and never see, never walk out from under the canopy of, of forests. We've really lost that. So... What, what were the trees in the forest? What type oh, of forest? Oh, it varied from place to place. I mean, it, it, and that, that's the other thing is there would have been a great diversity of trees. I mean, there would have been in, in the dry forest, koa'ia, willy willy, um, which is an erythrina. Uh, koa'ia is a, an acacia. It would have had species like nayo and, you know, again, lo'ulu, the, the prachardia palms. Uh, amazing to kind of even speculate on. And, and biodiversity would have been the catchword. And so, if, if we're if we're going to 
restore the health of our ecosystems, we need to think in terms of biodiversity. How do we, how do we regain what nature did automatically because we've disturbed it? I mean, we and, and, and our proxies, our cats, our dogs, our rats, and, and all these things, and how much can an ecosystem take before we really need to step in and say, wow, we've, we've made a mistake. And, and heheba, it was a mistake. Uh, we want to make it right. If we were here many years ago when it was pretty, um, maybe the Hawaiians were living sustainably mm-hmm. and yep. with, with no inputs. And Did they believe that people had a place? It sounds like they do. A place in the environment and kind of tending, stu- being stewards of the land. And what would that role be? Uh, yeah, a good example of that is uh, from where we're standing, about uh, 200 yards from where we're standing right now, uh, the Hawaiians built a, a, uh, a fish pond. You know, the fish ponds were very, very common across the Hawaiian Islands. Um, this was an inland fish pond. So fish pond in Hawaiian is known as a loko ia. The one we have here on this property, on, on the Waihe'e Refuge, is what's called a loko kalo ia. And so a loko kalo ia is oftentimes, most, well, not often, always, a freshwater pond. And so that freshwater pond uh, would bring... Uh, when water was brought around from around the dune, which is, again is an amazing uh, feat of engineering to think about bringing probably around 5 million gallons a day of fresh water from around a sand dune. Now, you would think, of course, there was some loss through the sand dune, but what we're finding is along the base of that, what's called an awai or an aqueduct, along the base of that awai, there were taro patches lining the whole dune system. And so nothing was... was um, it was all recaptured, reused, and again, this is about Okanaka, so we, it's it's our place to use it, um, not to displace others. You have a kuleana to to make sure that all species have what they need to, to thrive, but it's it's there to use. So that that concept of sustainability, this this local kaloia was built, and so what you have is you have a situation where you can raise fish, and as fish provide the fertilizer, the nutrients that enhance the, the, the kalo, that, that provide to the kalo. So you have this dynamic interaction of the fish species, freshwater fish. Now, the oopunakea. Uh, the oopunakea would get up to five pounds, which is, you know, a good, a good size trout. Um, uh, not all of them got up to that size. But uh, what I'm certain the Hawaiians knew, because you, you read accounts, is that certain near-shore saltwater fishes, if they're captured young enough and transition slowly enough, can actually grow and thrive in saltwater and, uh, excuse me, freshwater um, and, and you know, even slightly brackish water. Not only that, but to keep in mind, too, that the Hawaiians had, being just phenomenal agronomists, had developed at least 88 varieties of taro, at least 88 in and more likely, pretty much all the consensus is closer to 200, or perhaps more than 200, varieties of taro. Um, some of these varieties of taro could thrive in very uh, saline conditions. You know, the water was not perfectly fresh. Um, it had to be cool, but, you know, so what you have here is not necessarily saltwater intrusion into the fish pond, but you have what's called ehukai, the sea spray, um, going into the, into the fish pond. So, again... Everything was, uh, I mean, balance was what we're, that's pono. And so it was pono. It had to be pono. If it's, if it's uh, uh, ole pono, then you cannot have ola. You cannot have life. You have make. You have death. And, and so the idea is to, to find that dynamic balance. And we have to ask ourselves whether or not our, our existence is in balance. So a, when I think about, if, if I can kind of ca- encapsulate what is the essence of Hawaiian sustainability, The essence of Hawaiian sustainability, in my view, is to take a good area, Waihe'e, for example, and make it better. So we get, we get up here where we are, somewhere between 35 and 40 inches a year of uh, precipitation, rain, 35 to 40 inches a year. But you have all kinds of water coming down, uh, you know, subsurface water. You have, you know, it's it's a a wet area. We're in the... Um, shadow right now of Pu'ukukui, which is the, the summit of Mauna Kahalawai, the, the, uh, the what, sometimes known as the West Maui Mountains. And that, um, all that water, that's, that's where life comes from. Uh, in Hawaiian, the word for uh, wealth is vaivai, which is a uh, doubling of the word 
vai, which is water. So where you have water, you have wealth. Um, and so all that water coming down, what they realize is that you could capture that water and improve an area. So all that water coming down was captured and, and improved an area that was already good. I think what, if I had to summarize what our uh, lack of sustainability is, is what we're confronted by with that, is that we want to make uh, not bad areas, that's not the right word, but areas that are um, limited in natural resources. Because we have our technology that we can rely on, Oh, we can, you know, we have the technological know-how to bring water from the furthest point to the to the driest, or the wettest point to the driest area, and that's not pono. It's not the way. It, it, that's not the way things should run. Um, so when I go down to some of the resorts on the South Shore and I see these massive water features, I just I almost want to cry because we can barely get enough water for our kalo. Um, and so what what drives that? Again, the 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 heva, the, the the life out of balance, the 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 incorrectness that we're living, is not is not on the land. It's between our ears. It's it's in our minds. So, the, while the while the challenges are are daunting, they're not insurmountable, because they're only so far as, away as our own decision to try and live within our capacity and our abilities and our resources. Yeah. What is your vision for this land? What is yeah. your, the vision that you hold yeah, so, in your heart and gut? And yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, what, what, I, what would I like to see? I'd like to see the, the, the dunes once again teeming with seabirds. The seabirds um, are a critical element of the, of the habitat, and I'll get to that in just a moment. So that's my first thing. I'd love to see these dunes. 105 acres. I'd love to see a million, if I could put a number out there, a million seabirds on there, uh, on the sand dunes. Uh, I'd like to see the, if not gone, I'd like to see the invasive species at least under control. Um, I'd like to see the wetlands back as a functioning, structurally sound with, with the appropriate um, indigenous composition. Um, that's my vision for the wetlands. Now, the reason why the seabirds are critical to that is that Hawaiian wetlands are, are phosphorus deficient. You know, that's the limiting chemical in Hawaiian wetlands. On islands, because we're uh, geologically very young, on these islands, the source for phosphorus is your seabirds. So the two are linked. Again, we're, Hawaiian, uh, the Hawaiian way of thinking is to try and integrate these things. I think, unfortunately, too often in the West, we live under these false dichotomies. We, we separate and we, we pull apart things that are not meant to be pulled apart. And so when we ho'opili, when we put them back together in our mind's eye and, and express our vision, that's when we can actually make strides for ecosystem health. Okay, so we have the wetlands back to health. We have the, the dunes full of, of uh, seabirds once again, um, and in large part the in, in indigenous floral and, and faunal composition to the degree that we can um, back. I also want to see people down here. It's, it's not, we are in the Valkanaka. People need to be here, but people who come here need to be pono. They need to understand that, that, uh, that life in balance is, is, the, is the, what we're all striving for. But that doesn't mean that you can't have fun. That you, right now we have, I think, 10 or 15 people camping down here. I mean, we, we, we love to see that. So I have a wonderful job. My job, not only, as I've explained earlier, is to malama the aina, to care for the land, um, but it's also to komo aloha, you know, welcome with love um, the people who, who can learn to be back on the land. And so it's a, it's a slow process. School groups, I'd love to see school groups here. Uh, I'd love to see our, our taro patches, for example, providing food. In Hawaiian, it's known as a mala'ai, uh, a kind of a garden. But that food, of course, we can't eat all that food. I mean, I have a, I have a family, but we can only eat so much. Our our taro patches would produce way more than we could ever eat. So what, you, what do you do with that food? You give it to the kupuna, the people who can't um, otherwise maybe feed themselves. It's, that's part of, you know, you're, we're connected to them. We're connected to them through our pico. And so they get, they get the food. They get bananas and, and uala or sweet potatoes and uhi and yams and ohia uh, ai and, of course, kalo and taro. That's, that's my vision, a, a portion of my vision. I also would love to see further interpretation. How did, 
how did interpretation of the cultural sites, the historical sites, how did people live on the land? What was important to them about, about this area and the mo'olelo, the myths and legends? Uh, for example, the sand dunes, which I keep referring to, were mythologically um, built by Haumea. She was the goddess of childbirth. And so Haumea built these dunes to protect a sacred tree that was just over this hill called Kalau Ke Kahuli. Kalau Ke Kahuli um, no longer exists, and perhaps that's where, uh, where we're falling short of being Pono. And so, yeah, again, those are just ideas of uh, uh, Manao, uh, of how do we, how do we re- regain our, our sense of Pono with the land. And you spoke earlier also about the spiritual aspect, too, mm-hmm. of the land. Do you want to speak to that at all? Sure. I don't really know where to start. Um, well, okay, so um, the Hawaiian concept of, uh, so the spirit, one of the mo- mo- more important spiritual concepts, of course, was mana, that there was this animating force in all um, living and, and non-living things, at least things that we would see as non-living. Um, and so that mana manifested itself through the expression of, of concrete objects. And so, uh, for example, the, the gods, uh, the, the major gods, the akua, um, were expressed through um, what, they, what you might call kino lao, bodily forms. Literally, it means body leaf because those, they were expressions. Oftentimes of plants, um, it, was, it was how one could come in contact with that spiritual force. So, just for an example, Ku, the god of politics, warfare, fishing, and healing. His, one of his, his kino lao, of course, was the noni, which is the sort of the preeminent um, medicinal fruits of the Hawaiian community. Noni, the Mirinda citrifolia. I think it's gotten to be popular kind of, uh, in a lot of places. So, really, when we, start to, when we start to restore the land, what we're not, not only are we... Are we restoring the health, the ecosystem health. We're also touching um, on that spiritual side. We're, we're, we're interfacing with the kino lao of the akua. Um, another common term is almakua. Almakua, and your, almakua in Hawaiian thinking was your, your spirit guides. The, uh, the spirit guide was there to protect you. But they, were, they weren't just, probably the most commonly translated is a totem. You know, it was an animal that... Um, that was there to protect you in, in, in times of adversity, um, and in particular, uh, upon the passing of the individual, um, they were the ones to guide them to the to the lena, the jumping off place where you where you reunite with the ancestors. That was their that was their kuleana to guide you. But the the aumakua were ohana, and so through a through a ritual known as kakuai or ho'omanaman, kakuai was a ritual. Ho'omanamana was the process. You you endow this kupuna with the mana, ho'omanamana, and they become an aumakua after passing away. And so that and they're expressed not as um, ethereal bodily, uh, not as anything ethereal, but in very concrete kinolau, oftentimes as the uh, epueo, an owl. Um, you know, a number of honu, mano, honu being the, the turtles, or mano being a shark. Um, so many, many ways that they were expressed. And so this is, uh, you know, it, it's always very, very pleasing when, whenever we're doing work, sometimes we'll see those, you know, more traditional aumakua, and those, it, you get a sense that things are going right, that, that we're making it pono again. Um, many, many experiences out here where, where we could tell that, where you get that uh, sense that, the kupuna, the aumakua are, are looking favorably upon the work. It's a very nice feeling. And it builds that sense of reverence for sharks, we all sure. know, or have been maligned. Yeah. And that really, it's including, that's your ancestor, or yes. that's your helper. Yes. exactly. That's your aumakua. That's the one. Your family. Uh, yeah, of course, you would never, never harm an, an aumakua. You know, it, it's, it's very easy to think, though, that the, these omakua were sort of the more dramatic, and oftentimes they were the more dramatic um, things, but they were also, the Hawaiians had omakua as uh, modest and humble as the, the sea cucumber, the loli, so, uh, or, or even a caterpillar could be your, your omakua. So it wasn't just the more dramatic species that, you know, we, we see around and, and are awed by, but sometimes the ones that we were... Uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, unimpressed by too often. So, but that was your that was your kupuna, that was your ancestor. So you had a you had a direct relationship with that, and 
And as you as you walk the land, you you look for these um, these signs um, that that the Omakua were there, that they were present. And so even today, we definitely um, look for those things. You know, as as the life of the land is is being restored, is being made pono. Again, getting back to the idea of ua mau ke e o ka aina ka pono, the life of the land being perpetuated in righteousness. We're constantly looking for those signs. Um, we use scientific methods. I'm, you know, at heart a, a scientist, but I'm also a Hawaiian. I, you know, and so I, I'm always trying to balance these two things. And, and it doesn't take much because wisdom is wisdom. Na au au is na au au. You know, it, it's where... Um, it's when you don't follow your, uh, in English, your heart, in, in Hawaiian, your, your gut, um, that, that we fail. So. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Come back anytime. In fact, one thing I always try to uh, convey to people before they leave is that if you get nothing else away from this talk, from, from being on the land, is that to know that you're always welcome to come back. And, cool. and could you give us contact information? Sure. Okay, my, my email address is scott at Hilt, H-I-L-T, uh, that's Hawaiian Islands Land Trust, dot org. We're a nonprofit, so it's dot org. My office number, uh, which I'm not in the offices, I'm only in the offices as much as I absolutely need to be, uh, but is 808-244-5263. And if, you, if I'm not there, my coworkers will tell you how to get a hold of me. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. For more information or to hear our other podcasts or interviews, visit www.sustainableworldradio.com. Sustainable World Radio is produced by Jill Cloutier. Music by Dana Lyons. Thanks for listening.